ואפילו בצורכי הגוף, לא ירבה עוד מדברים. Even things which are necessary, necessities for our physical existence, we should try to minimize the amount of speech used for that. ועל זה ציבו חכמים, ואומרו כל אמר בדבור ימי בחט. The rabbis taught us, this is in Pirkei Ovos, if you speak excessively, even for things which are necessities, ultimately it brings sin, meaning you will say something that you shouldn't say. I'll give you an example. A person is able to say something with less words, he says it with more words. What does that mean? That means even when he speaks for something's necessity, he's not really that careful of how he expresses it. The moment he's at a level that he's not precise, that everything he says is for a necessity, because if he could have said it in a more abbreviated level, why did you speak it, express it in a more extensive level? You could have communicated the same thing without saying more. So saying more rather than saying less to bring about the same result, that means you're not that exacting precise with your speech. The moment you're not that precise with your speech, that means things come out of your mouth which are not necessary. Once you speak at that level, other things may come out. You may see other things which what's not necessary may actually be sinful. If every word you say is calculated, because it has to be said, I only say things that have to be said. But even if I'm saying, communicating a subject matter that has to be said, but if could, I could say it with less words, why did I use more words? The answer is, you overran the runway in terms of saying more. The moment you're not that precise, automatically you're subject, you're exposing yourself that you may say things that you shouldn't say altogether. That's the understanding. We're not speaking about you just, you have the gift of gab. Even for things that you that you need, where necessities, you should not say more than you have to say. Rabshim, the son of Judah, the prince says, all my life I've grown up among the wisest and the greatest characteristics I've come upon Silence. Even when we speak words of Torah, which again, these are words of wisdom or words of truth. If you could say something less words, but the profoundness is beyond the word, that's what should be said. When you teach you sh- and you communicate concepts to your students, it should always be in the most abbreviated form, which is, it's a whole different concept. The way it seems from the Talmud, to be able to recall things, if you have an abbreviated, a coined phrase, that phrase contains it all. If you go and you have you expand it, it's much more difficult to remember. I'll give you an example. The story, Hillel was the prince of the Jewish people. And there were three non-Jews who wanted to convert. And one of the non-Jews, first they went to Shammai, who was a, a contemporary of Hillel, and, w- and they came to convert on, con- on a condition. So they come to Shammai, one of them says, I want you to teach me one principle that, that encompasses the whole Torah. Shammai says, no, do me a favor, don't waste my time. And he dismissed him. He comes to Hillel, and Hillel says, I will teach you that one principle. Don't do unto your, unto your fellow what you will not do unto yourself. But it's the other side of love your fellow as you love yourself, but don't do the negative. What you don't want somebody to do negative to you, don't do unto the other person. That encompasses the Torah's its entirety. Now, the rest is all commentary. So, in those few words, that concept he communicated contains the Torah's entirety. Now, we have to have commentary on it to be able to expand it. But what encapsulates everything? Those few words. 
So therefore, when you teach a student, you teach him the most to communicate the concept in an abbreviated form. Those words contain everything. Now we can expound on it. We can reflect on it. But the concept, where do we see this concept? We have the written law and we have the oral law. They're both divine. The written law, every word of the written law, you read the Rambam in his introduction to Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he wrote the written law, it was like a scribe being dictated by the master to commit it to writing. So God was the dictate was dictating, and Moshe was only a scribe. Every word, every letter of the Torah, it's written, and it's stated as it is because God communicated that to Moshe. Then he gave him the oral law. That's God's commentary on the Torah. We have the Talmud. The Talmud is the what is the commentary on the written law. That's elucidation of the or of the oral law. So initially, we have the Mishnah. The Mishnah is written in a very concise form. The Talmud elucidates the Mishnah. So what is it? God wrote a few words, said a few words. Before a blind man, don't put a stumbling block. What do those words mean? We could expound on it for, for, for 20 days. But how did God communicate that? In very few words, very concise. So just as God was concise, and he gave us an understanding of what those words mean, identically when we communicate it and we pass it on, we should all do it in a similar form, which is concise. Of course, it has to be not too concise, it has to be sufficient that within those words lie the ability to understand what that means. When Judah the Prince redacted the oral law into the Mishnah, the Mishnah is a very concise, abbreviated form. The members of the Mishnahic period, who were known as Tanoim, they didn't need the Talmud, the Gemara, to elucidate the Mishnah. They were at a level, they understood within those few words, within that small paragraph, which the Talmud, the Amoraim, which were the next era, it took them pages to elucidate just a few of those phrases. So you only say as much as you have to say. More than that, don't say it. But, but it seems to me, it all goes into this concept that even when you communicate Advar Chochmo, something of wisdom of Torah, it should be done in an abbreviated form. Because if it's not, the moment you allow you say to say more than you have to say, you may say what you're, you're not supposed to say. You know, there's, there's an expression, the art of listening. People are not good listeners. A person who's a good listener He's able, why is the person not a good listener? It takes tremendous training. You want to share with me something which is profound and has value. And as you try to explain it, I interject or I say something. But you realize before you said it, as it was being said, you were thinking about what you were going to say. That means you weren't fully attentive listening to what was being said. Because if you would have been fully attentive, you'd wait for the person to finish speaking. And then if you have what to say, then you would ask the question. Or you'd make a comment. So why do you interject in the middle of the person speaking? The answer is because when you heard some of what he was going to say, either you, you contemplate what was going to be said, either you're okay with it or you're not okay with it, but how could you not be okay with it? You haven't even heard all that he was going to say. So the moment you don't remain silent to allow the person to finish what he's saying automatically, that says you're not a good listener. Because if you fully listened to what he said, you would have finished, wait to fit, he should finish speaking, and then you would ask your question or interject. But even if we speak in the middle, you interject, you were thinking of what you were going to interject that automatically says you weren't fully attentive to what was being said. 
Therefore, we say, Syog Lechach Meshtika. Offense for wisdom is silence. You want to become wise? You want to be able to have the full force of that wisdom that's being communicated to? Remain silent. Let it be, let it be first said. But you know, even so if you have to suppress it, to be silent, it's all it's, it's still a problem. Because here I want to, I'm thinking about saying something, but the moment you're suppressing, that means you're not fully attentive to what's being said. So even though factually you are silent, but you have to train yourself, even to the point that not only are you not speaking, but you're not thinking about what you want to say. Because the moment you think about what you want to say, you're not fully attentive to, to what's being said. You know, when I teach, I've been teaching a long time. And when I teach, I already know the kind of question I'm going to get. Even before they ask the question. And I can see even on the faces sometimes, I know exactly what each person's going to ask, the type of question he's going to ask. And I preempt him that I said, just wait one moment, and I say something else. So then I say, to the person, what were you going to ask? He says, you answered already. You know, that? but I have a sense exactly where they're coming from. And therefore, so somebody says, says to me, why don't you, let me, let me ask my question. I, I said, I know exactly what you're going to ask. He says, no, you don't. I said, I say, ask your question. And sure enough, it's the question that he was going to ask. Okay, but sometimes people, they actually get upset that I'm not giving them the due time to let them ask the question. But factually, you're wasting everybody's time. Because till you get your question out of your mouth, if it's the two of us, you're not only wasting my time, you're wasting everybody else's time. Because they have to ask your question, and if you would only listen a little further, you don't understand why your question is not a question. So we're dealing with egos very often. Egos. That's what we're dealing with. To be a student and remain silent, you have to not have a, a big ego. I'm listening. I'll reflect on it. I'll think about it. And afterwards, if I have a question, I'll ask the question. But I first want to fully understand what's being said. Very often, when I started to teach, not when I started, when I st taught in New York, the people were very, had very specialized backgrounds, graduated best universities. And we started to study Gemara, Talmud. And the people would say to me, Rabbi, it doesn't make any sense. Because, you know, this guy has a graduate degree from Stanford, from who knows where. Doesn't make sense. So I said, no, it makes sense. You don't understand. With time, you'll, be able, you'll begin understanding what you don't understand. So now, where you're coming from doesn't make sense. But it does make sense. There are no fallacies in the Talmud. You just have to come upon the understanding to understand why it makes sense. So again, everybody's coming with his ego. And sometimes you have to give that person that slack to let him feel valued and he'll learn that the teacher understands what he's going to ask and that he'll ultimately understand he doesn't have to ask the question. Because if he just has a little patience, the teacher will be able to have the, has the ability to fully elucidate it so he doesn't have to ask the question. But again, that comes with, with, with experience, experiencing the uh, professionalism or the capacity of the teacher. Offense to protect wisdom is silence. Silence means be fully attentive. Don't interject. I'll tell you something. A person who has an exceptional mind, what, what's his cap capacity and what's other people's capacity? A person has an average, even though a person is above average. I, I 
put out a concept. Okay? And a person has a question. So I say to the person, we'll get to that question. I just want to first explain the fundamental principle. The person says, but this question bothers me. So I say, the question is a good question, but you have to be patient. And when we get there, after you understand this, we'll address the second question. Because very often to understand things, it's based on what, what fundamentals, what's first, second, and the certain basic concepts, which allows you to go to the next level. A person who has a very good mind, he's able to take that question and put it on the, on the back burner, is fully attentive, and then we address the next question that he was going to ask. A person with an ordinary mind, or a mind that's not trained, you know what he does? He, you tell him, we'll get there. But while you're trying to explain the first principle, he's still bothered with the question he asked. And because he's still bothered with the question he asked, he doesn't fully comprehend the basic principle because he's distracted with the second question, the third question, the fourth question. He can't somehow stagger it to put it aside to be fully attentive as to understand as we go along. We find in the Torah that Eliezer was commissioned to find a wife for Yitzchok. And Eliezer beats Rivka. And he asks her a few questions. <laughs> and when she asked, answered the questions, he asked her one, two questions. When she answered, she first answered the first question, and then she asked the, answered the second question. She didn't answer the second question for the first question. Why? That's a sign of wisdom. Why? Because when you answer a question, you first you answer the first question and the second question. But why is that a sign of wisdom? Now, why does a person ask two questions and the first question is asked before the second question? Evidently, the first question is more pressing. That's why you ask the first question first. And the second question, you ask second. So when you respond, which question should you respond to first? Out of consideration for the one who asked the question. The question, which is more question, person question. Therefore, Rivka, a sign of her intelligence, she answered the first question before she answered the second question. Because that was the order, the sequence in which the person asked the question. These are concepts. If the first question is more pressing, I should ask the first question before the second. Because the second question is secondary to the first. And besides, the second question, very often, the person can't be fully appreciative of the answer to the second question sometimes. Because the first question is more pressing. Therefore, what you should do is listen. We all have to be good listeners. Listen doesn't mean silence. It's listening and be, be focused on what or what's being said. If you read the biography of Ramosha Feinstein, Zechat Tzadok Lebrocha, it's, it's worthwhile. Otsko put it out for the 25th anniversary of his yard site, of his pet. Passing. The man knew everything. He had a mind was like a computer. He was a genius beyond genius. What he's able to understand in a moment. And he would very often come and there'd be a speaker. You know, say whatever the speaker would say, he already knew. And even if he didn't know it, if he didn't come upon what the speaker said, usually. It's something which maybe wasn't that important he should even listen to. His mind, because his mind, he whenever he walked, he didn't need any books. Everything was committed to memory. But nevertheless, whenever he would attend any event that there was a speaker, he would not pick up a, a, a safer, a book to look in out of respect. And when the speaker would speak, he would focus directly, look at the speaker's face to give the speaker that sense of value that he's being fully attentive to what the speaker is saying. That's that's way he conducted himself. If the great rabbi is listening to me, evidently he values what I'm saying. 
So it gave that person that sense of value. But again, he could have been preoccupied. He could have listened with a tenth of an ear and gotten exactly what the person was saying. But out of consideration for the speaker, he gave it, he gave him his full attention. Although a fraction of his attention would have been enough to be able to grasp what the man is saying, doesn't make a difference. That's called consideration. So there are many levels of why silence is so crucial. It's what it's a offense for wisdom. Firstly, to be fully attentive and not be distracted with your question. Secondly, a person who has no consideration with another person, what you say is not important. And therefore, I interject, it's what I think and what I have to say. Automatically, you're not so wise. You know, the mission tells us, you're able to learn from anyone based on a verse in David's words. Who's a wise man? A person who could learn from anyone, even from a child. Because if a person says, I know it all, and nobody could teach me, that person's a fool. There's no such thing as you know it all. The moment you feel you know it all, automatically, whatever you listen to, you're already deficient. Yet You have a deficit because you don't have the capability or capacity to value what anybody else has to say. So remaining silent, that means you're actually giving yourself, a, uh, putting some position, I want to hear what you have to say. So that is offense for wisdom. You want to be a, have a, be a receptacle to absorb wisdom, remain silent. Even for new wisdom, not only to, to, to retain what you have, but even to acquire new wisdom. Because the moment you, you devalue somebody else, what he may be telling you may be invaluable. But because you, your, your persona is, I know it better. What could he teach me? You don't listen. And if you don't listen, what you could gain, you're not going to gain if there is something to gain. Shmuel, this is Peter here. The Chavetz Chaim was on the train going to Vilna. And it was about a two-hour trip. And uh, a farmer was sitting next to him, a Jewish farmer. And he doesn't realize this is the Chavetz Chaim he's sitting next to. The Chavetz Chaim, he, he, dressed in, he didn't dress in rabbinic garb. He wore an ordinary coat with a fisherman's cap. He looked like, a, like an ordinary Lithuanian Russian Jew. And he's speaking to Chavetz Chaim and telling him about his chickens and his chicken feed and his cows and how he gets up in the morning, milks them, and how he takes it to market. And he's chewing off the Chavetz Chaim's ear for, for two hours. And the Chavetz Chaim asks questions, by the way, and how do you do it? What's your profit? And he's making the field, showing him that he's really interested in the conversation. All of a sudden, the train approaches Vilna. Thousands of people are waiting in the train station to greet, evidently, there must be some great personality on this train. So the farmer says to Chavetz Chaim, is something going on? I see all these people, thousand people, they're waiting. Is there some special special personality? And he says, I have no idea. All of a sudden, the train stops. They come on the train. They lift the Chavetz Chaim out of his seat. And he's the guest of, he's the one they're waiting for. The farmer felt terrible. The Chavetz Chaim was known, didn't waste a moment outside of speaking different words of Torah. And here, this guy chewed his ear off. The Chavetz Chaim's interacting about the chicken feet of the cows. And what do you do with the manure? <laughs> and, you know, the man says, Rabbi, forgive me. I wasted your time. He says, you don't understand. It was a pleasure talking to you. I began speaking to anybody else. The first things that come out of the mouth is Loshanara. I have to cut the conversation. At that point, you, it was a pleasure. The cows, the chickens, the feed. I could speak to you for hours. That was the Chavetz Chaim's response. And that's the reality. To certain people, you have to, that, and that's exactly what we're talking about. When a Chochem speaks or interjects, you have to evaluate and analyze what he's saying. Because he doesn't say anything unless it has to be said. And how he says it. And why he says it. Everything's calculated. Even though he spoke with the interactive for two hours, everything during that two-hour period had value. Because it wouldn't if the Chochem wouldn't have said it. It was known when the 
the the tolls they used to have, when you went through a toll they used to have a toll collector afterwards they mechanized it you used to take the money and throw it in if you had the exact change you threw into the into that whatever is that pan and then the light, when you went through Ravar and Kotler, a blessed memory when they started with the automatic you go through just throw the money into the pan he says to the driver who drove him I want to go through the, with the toll collectors why because when I go through I want to say to him thank you for working and taking the toll from me because when I say thank you it gives him a sense of value I throw it through who who gives the toll the toll collector a sense of value he should be valued therefore I want to go through the toll even if it takes a few moments longer I prefer go through the toll collector to give him that so why is he saying those words well, he's, when I'm told, but he's a Jew, it doesn't make a difference. If you're able to give a person a sense of value and you're able to do it, you do it. But that's only if you, of that caliber of person. Otherwise, say, look, I have to get where I'm going, throw it into the pan, let's go. That's going to take an, an extra 30 seconds. It's too long for me to waste. I don't have that time to waste. It's a whole different evaluation system.